Hello everyone. So, um, at the end of the last video, uh, they had, um, they talked about the Doolittle raid and I said I would go try to find that one and maybe just throw it in. I don't have to. It's episode 21. So, I'll do it when I get to it. Um, so, uh, this is 18. Uh, I'm going to butcher the name. Hideki Tojo, bringing Japan into the war. Okay. Um, I'm going to mute the mic for a little bit. I'm going to get this air kicked on because it's a little warm in here. When we think of World War II, one of the first things that comes to mind is the rise of dictators. Italy saw the rise of Benito Mussolini and his National Fascist Party, beginning with their march on Rome in 1922. Adolf Hitler rose to power as the leader of the Nazi Party, becoming the Führer und Reichskanzler in 1934, consolidating a dictatorship lasting from 1933 to 1945. Although it never had an official dictator, the Empire of the Rising Sun gradually saw one man rise to the top echelon. This episode is part one of our mini-series on Hideki Tojo within our larger series on the Pacific War. Throughout Hideki Tojo... I did a pretty good job on nailing the name, sorry it's so loud. ...Tojo's life, a small military consideration was getting larger and larger, that being camouflage, the literal art of deceiving your enemy, with the rise in aerial recon searching large areas, making it a... Hideki Tojo was born on December 30th, 1884, to a relatively low I wonder if he's still alive. Just kidding. ...ranking samurai family in the Kojimachi district of present-day Chiyoda, Tokyo. He was the third son of Hidenori Tojo, a lieutenant general in the Imperial Japanese Army, and Chitose Tojo, the daughter of a Buddhist priest. Tojo... That is a lot of medals. Wow. All right. Had an education typical of most Japanese youth during the Meiji era. The purpose of the Meiji educational system was to train boys to be soldiers and girls to produce as many sons as possible, who could then die for the emperor in war. Japanese students were taught that war was the most beautiful thing in the entire world, that the emperor was a living god and that the greatest honor was to die for him. Tojo was notorious for being opinionated and combative, with a lack of a sense of humor during his youth. Japanese schools in the Meiji era were notoriously competitive, and Tojo fought often with other boys to pursue his goals. He was deemed to have average intelligence by those who knew him, but would compensate for this with an extreme work ethic. Tojo followed in his father's footsteps, joining the Army Cadet School in 1899, and then the Japanese Military Academy in 1904. In 1905, Tojo shared the general outrage felt by most in Japan in response to the Treaty of Portsmouth, signed at the end of the Russo-Japanese War. The treaty was seen as a betrayal of Japan by the United States, leading to the anti-American riots known as the Hibiya Riots. Tojo, like many others in Japan, believed that America, specifically President Theodore Roosevelt, had cheated Japan of its gains in the war against Russia, which pushed their nation to the verge of bankruptcy. Tojo viewed this as a racist affront to Japan, and that the West would never recognize a non-white country as a first-tier power. This anger towards the West would leave a long-lasting impact on Tojo's life. Upon graduating from the Japanese Military Academy, ranked 10th of the 363 cadets in March of 1905, he was instilled with the military values of the period, those being complete loyalty to the emperor and subversion of one's individuality to the state. He was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the IJA, and in 1909 he married Katsuko Ito. They had three sons, Hideteke, Toshio and Terio, alongside four daughters, Mitsue, Sachie, Makie and Kimie, 
In 1912, he entered the Army Staff College and by 1915 earned the rank of Captain and Commanding Officer of the 3rd Imperial Guards Regiment. At the end of World War I, Japan earned a spot in the Council of Ten to officially decide the peace terms. Japan had bitter memories of the Yellow Peril rhetoric and was aggravated by discrimination against Asiatics amongst Western nations. Versailles offered a chance to overturn the imposed racial inferiority of Japan, and to finally allow them to take their rightful place among the victorious great powers. Japan brought to the table the racial equality proposal in the Treaty of Versailles for members of the League of Nations. The proposal received a majority vote, but was overturned by President Woodrow Wilson. This was a Huh. I'm going to see what they said, why Wilson did it. Accompanied in 1924 by the Asian Exclusion Act, furthering the Gentlemen's Agreement of 1907. For most Japanese... Okay, well, they didn't really say it. So this is the only thing I can really say about Wilson. I know that when he was trying to put together the League of Nations, uh, he had an uphill battle... I'm not defending. I'm going to go both sides. This is the good part. He really did try to keep the peace. He did not want that much pressure put on uh, Germany to have to pay back their, its war debts. But France, was it France? Uh, England, all the others, they were like, no. And they really turned the screws on him. He was working with Republicans in Congress. And then... He made a stupid statement, which it's, it's not a stupid statement, it's a political statement. It's always stupid. He said all Republicans were against it. The Republicans had been working with him to get it passed, and immediately they just gave up. He had a stroke, gets out of office. Um, the predecessor... What's his name? Warren G. Harding. Warren G. Harding, right here. He, uh... Was it Warren G. Harding? Yes, because he died in office. He was 29 and then 30 was Calvin Coolidge. So... Uh, Warren G. Harding didn't care about the League of Nations. Um, that Okay, so that was the good part, even though he kind of sank the thing for the U.S. The bad part is Wilson was born during the Civil War in Virginia, moved to Georgia. He carried racist tendencies with him up through being uh, at a, the college professor oh, I want to say Yale but I don't know if that's it now um, so I could see why he might have overturned it you know racism against Asians racism against blacks it's it is a thing in our history it is what it is and I I don't fault them for it because that was the the thought of the people not just this one person of the people they all got on board with this this is just it's the stupidity of the time and so I don't fault them for it much like in a hundred years there are things that we're gonna do I could name some but I don't want to hurt people's feelings that I think is batshit stupid um, like having pronouns I said it look I'm more Democrat but I'm a sh I think that's the whole thing is stupid I think it's just stupid 
Then never mind any of that. But you know, you. My point is that it's it's hard to judge the person. You have to judge the time, and at the time, unfortunately racism and this type of thing was accepted. It's not like America was the only one against it. So, not trying to... I guess I'm more trying to shed light. I'm not trying to say Wilson was right. I'm not saying he was wrong. I'm, I'm not defending him. I'm not attacking him. I'm just saying you have to look at the situation as the whole. You can't just look at a one person in history including Tojo, it seemed that the US would never accept Japan as an equal, cementing Tojo's hatred. From and I and that is totally I get it. I understand it. And if I'm in that situation, what's to say that I'm not agreeing with him? You know, if I was if I was Japanese, what's to say that I don't agree with what he's just done or not what he's just said, what he's just said. We're we're never because of Wilson, we're never going to get the proper treatment. Of course I would agree with it. You put me in Japan, of course I would agree with that. So... 1918 uh, to 1919, uh, Tojo saw some action. Serving briefly in Siberia as part of the Japanese Expeditionary Force sent to intervene in the Russian Civil War. Afterwards, between 1919 and 1922, he was sent as a military attaché to Germany to be trained by the German military alongside other military personnel. In the 1920s, the German military favoured preparing for the next war by creating a totalitarian Wehrstadt, a defence state, and this idea was adopted by the Japanese military. In 1922, Tojo was on his way back home and took a train ride across the United States, his first and only visit to America. His impression was that the Americans were materialistic, soft people, only devoted to the pursuit of wealth and hedonistic desires such as sex and drinking. In 1928, Tojo was assigned as a bureau chief in the IJA and was promoted to colonel. He then began to take an interest in militarist politics. In 1934, he was promoted to major general and served as a chief of the personnel department within the army ministry. It was then that he wrote a chapter in a book titled Essays in Time of National Emergency, calling for Japan to become a totalitarian national defense state. In his essay, Tojo accused Britain, France and the US of waging an ideological war against Japan since 1919, insisting that Japan must stand tall and spread its own moral principles to the world. The following year, Tojo was given command of the Kempei Tai in Manchuria, and earned himself the nickname Kamisori, meaning razor, for his cold-blooded nature and strict by-the-book mentality. It was also during this time that the IJA had competing political factions, such as the Tosiha Control Faction and Kodoha Imperial Way Faction. Both factions were militaristic, favoring a policy of expansionism associated with a dictatorship under the emperor. The Kodoha faction sought to achieve this via a coup d'etat and was willing to use assassination to meet its goals. The Kodoha also advocated for an invasion of the Soviet Union. The Tosiha faction was also willing to use assassination to meet their goals, but sought reform by working within the existing system and foresaw a future war to be a total war. They sought to maximize Japan's industrial and military capacity by working alongside the Japanese bureaucracy and Seibatsu conglomerates, which the Kodoha despised. The Tosiha were unwilling to do something as radical as a coup d'etat. Tojo was a member of the Tosiha, and during the February 26th coup attempt of 1936, led by many Kodoha supporters, he opposed the rebels. Emperor Hirohito was outraged by the attacks, and as the commander of the Kempei Tai, Tojo ordered the arrest of all officers in the Kwantung army suspected of supporting the coup. This led the Tosiha faction to purge many radical members of the military. Coup leaders were tried and executed. Following the purge, the Tosiha and Kodoha gradually unified under the Tosiha banner, including Tojo among their leaders. In 1937, Tojo was promoted to chief of staff of the Kwantung army. Like most of his colleagues, 
Tojo regarded preparing for a war with the Soviet Union as first priority, but also supported the forward policy in northern China. When the Second Sino-Japanese War broke out, Tojo commanded the Chaha Expeditionary Force during Operation Chaha. Tojo personally led the 1st Independent Mixed Brigade, crushing the Chinese forces in Changpei, Shenwei Taiko on the Great Wall, and Hano Dam. This was Tojo's only real combat experience, but he proved up to the task and gained popular support. Tojo went on to order forces to attack Hebei and other parts of northern China. He also went on to play a key role in utilizing Manchuria's natural resources to feed the industry of Japan, gaining close connections to important figures like the Deputy Minister of Industry in Manchukuo, Nobusuke Kishi, and the ultra-nationalist CEO of the South Manchuria Railway, Yosuke Matsuoka. In 1938, Tojo was recalled to Japan to serve as Vice Minister of War and Chief of Army Aviation under Army Minister Seishiro Itagaki. Seishiro Itagaki was a member of Fumimaro Konoe's cabinet, and on July 22, 1940, Tojo was appointed War Minister by Prime Minister Konoe. Konoe chose Tojo because he represented both the army's hardline views and the Toseha faction's views, but was relatively reasonable to deal with. Tojo was well respected for his intense work ethic and proved himself devoted to the emperor, believing him to be a living god and favoring direct imperial rule. In his new role, Tojo expanded the Second Sino-Japanese War, which included the supervision of atrocities committed in China. Tojo was also instrumental in forming the tripartite pact between Japan, Germany, and Italy. Konoe had started the war with China in 1937 and sought to establish better relations with Germany and the United States, taking advantages of the changes to the international order caused by Germany's sweeping victories in the spring of 1940. Konoe sought to have Germany mediate an end to the Second Sino-Japanese War by pressuring Britain to end its support of China, hoping for a pro-Japanese peace settlement. Yet to attempt a diplomatic solution to the China affair, Konoe required a solid cover, that being the ultra-nationalist Tojo. Ultimately, Konoe sought to make Japan the dominant power in East Asia, while trying to have the United States recognize the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. This would, however, never become a reality because of Tojo. As army minister, Tojo did... Oh man. I'm just absorbed into this. This is really a great series. All right, come on. Let's get back to the video. As army minister, Tojo did not only expand the war with China, he also pushed the unofficial invasion of French Indochina in September 1940. This was met with Western condemnation, and the United States embargoed scrap metal shipments to Japan and closed the Panama Canal to Japanese shipping. Tojo would follow this up by negotiating with Vichy France to gain permission for Japanese troops to be placed in southern French Indochina in July 1941. This was met again with retaliation by the United States, who froze Japanese assets on July 26, 1941. Roosevelt met with the Japanese ambassador to the US, Admiral Nomura, the same day, telling him that if Japan agreed to pull out of Indochina, Japanese assets could be unfrozen. Konoe did not take any aggressive action to implement Roosevelt's offer, as he could not restrain the militarists led by Tojo. As Minister of War, Tojo regarded the seizure of Indochina as irreversible due to its approval by the Emperor. By July 28, Japan formally occupied southern Indochina, and by August 1st, the United States imposed an oil embargo on Japan. Ooh. By October 1941, it seemed that resolving the China affair and Indochina conflict diplomatically was going nowhere, and during Prime Minister Konoe's last cabinet meeting, Tojo hawkishly did most of the talking. The prevailing opinion within the IJA was that continuing negotiations would lead to Japan losing face, yet many still sought to avoid conflict with the West. Tojo argues that he did not want war with the United States, but that any compromises henceforth would only encourage the US to make more extreme demands of Japan, 
it might be better to choose war and uphold national honour. Tojo and the militarists pressed the cabinet to commit to an actual deadline for a decision for war with the West, set for October 15, 1941. Prime Minister Konoe held a last private meeting with Tojo on October 14, one day before the deadline for war. Konoe attempted to press Tojo to stand down from his war stance and accede to US demands for a military withdrawal from China and Indochina. Tojo ruled that it was out of the question and in the following cabinet meeting declared the military's resolve for war. After the conference, Tojo went to see Lord Keeper of the Privy Seal to push for Konoe's resignation. Prime Minister Konoe had become isolated at this point, convinced that the Emperor no longer trusted him. Tojo sent the head of the cabinet planning board, Teichi Suzuki, to urge Konoe to resign. If he did so, Tojo would endorse Prince Naruhiko Higashikuni as the next Prime Minister. Suzuki said that Tojo realized that Japan could not hope to face the US, and that a cabinet under Higashikuni could reverse Japan's course of action, as he was said to be the only person who could control the army and the navy. Konoe resigned on October 16, 1941, after recommending Prince Naruhiko Higashikuni to the Emperor as his successor. Two days later, Emperor Hirohito rejected the option, arguing that a member of the imperial family should not carry the responsibility for a war against the West, as a defeat would ruin the prestige of House Yamato. Emperor Hirohito chose instead Hideki Tojo, who was known for his devotion to the Emperor, with the promise that the new Prime Minister would re-examine all possible options for averting war with the United States. Tojo pledged to the Emperor personally to obey this order, and indeed... Can I just say, Japan has a cool flag. They really do have a cool flag. It did show a true sense of loyalty performing this duty. This was seen on one occasion when Emperor Hirohito sent a communication to the army, saying that it should drop the idea of stationing troops in China to counter military operations of the Western powers, and Tojo complied obediently. By November 2nd, 1941, Tojo and the chiefs of staff Hajime Sugiyama and Osami Nagano reported to Emperor Hirohito their failure to find any potential peaceful solutions with the Western powers. Emperor Hirohito gave his consent to war, and the very next day, Fleet Admiral Osami Nagano exposed to the Emperor the details of the plan to attack Pearl Harbor. The attack was accompanied by orders from Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto that the fleet was to return to Japan at a moment's notice should negotiations succeed. On November 5, 1941, Emperor Hirohito approved the operations for a war against the West. On November 26, the United States issued a memorandum called the Hull Note, which demanded the complete withdrawal of Japanese forces from China and Indochina in exchange for lifting the oil embargo but left the term China undefined. The Hull Note implied that the US might recognize the Empire of Manchukuo and did not impose a real deadline for the Japanese withdrawal from China. The next day, Tojo intentionally misrepresented the Hull Note to the cabinet as an ultimatum to Japan, claiming that it demanded Japanese withdrawal from all of China, instead of just the parts occupied since the outbreak of war in 1937. Under Tojo and his cabinet's advice, Emperor Hirohito approved, during the Imperial Conference of December 1st, 1941, the Pearl Harbor attack and war against the United States, Britain and the Netherlands. Wow. In a memorandum about Hirohito's ascent, Tojo was quoted to say, I'm perfectly relieved. You can say we've already won the war, given the current situation. The next episode of our series on the Pacific War will be released soon so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. Please consider liking, commenting. It's very interesting. I didn't realize um, uh, Hideki Tojo. Uh, he really was gung-ho about war. But misrepresenting that, oh, yeah. Well, what's done is done. 
So I'm going to end the video here. Like and subscribe. And until the next one, you have a good day and have a good night.